Chapter 2 Palankar Valley The sun rose the next morning with a glorious conflagration of pink and yellow. The air was fresh, sweet, and very cold. Ice edged the streams, and small pools were completely frozen over. After a breakfast of porridge, Aragon returned to the glen and examined the charred area. The morning light revealed no new details, so he started for home. The rough game trail was faintly worn and, in places, non-existent. Because it had been forged by animals, it often backtracked and took long detours. Yet, for all its flaws, it was still the fastest way out of the mountains. The Spine was one of the only places that King Galbatorix could not call his own. Stories were still told about how half his army disappeared after marching into its ancient forest. A cloud of misfortune and bad luck seemed to hang over it. Though the trees grew tall and the sky shone brightly, few people could stay in the Spine for long without suffering an accident. Aragon was one of those few. Not through any particular gift, it seemed to him, but because of persistent vigilance and sharp reflexes. He had hiked in the mountains for years, yet he was still wary of them. Every time he thought they had surrendered their secrets, something happened to upset his understanding of them, like the stone's appearance. He kept up a brisk pace, and the leagues steadily disappeared. In late evening, he arrived at the edge of a precipitous ravine. The Enora River rushed by far below, heading to Palancar Valley. Gorged with hundreds of tiny streams, the river was a brute force, battling against the rocks and boulders that barred its way. A low rumble filled the air. He camped in a thicket near the ravine and watched the moon rise before going to bed. It grew colder over the next day and a half. Aragon traveled quickly and saw little of the wary wildlife. A bit past noon, he heard the Igualda Falls blanketing everything with the dull sound of a thousand splashes. The trail led him onto a moist slate outcropping, which the river sped past, flinging itself into empty air and down mossy cliffs. Before him lay Palancar Valley, exposed like an unrolled map. The base of the Igualda Falls, more than a half mile below, was the northernmost point of the valley. A little ways from the falls was Carvajal, a cluster of brown buildings. White smoke rose from the chimneys, defiant of the wilderness around it. At this height, farms were small, square patches no bigger than the end of his finger. The land around them was tan or sandy, where dead grass swayed in the wind. The Enora River wound from the falls toward Palancar's southern end, reflecting great strips of sunlight. Far in the distance, it flowed past the village Therensford and the lonely mountain Utgard. Beyond that, he knew only that it turned north and ran to the sea. After a pause, Aragon left the outcropping and started down the trail, grimacing at the descent. When he arrived at the bottom, soft dusk was creeping over everything, blurring colors and shapes into gray masses. Carvajal's lights shimmered nearby in the twilight. The houses cast long shadows. Aside from Therensford, Carvajal was the only village in Palancar Valley. The settlement was secluded and surrounded by harsh, beautiful land. Few traveled here except merchants and trappers. The village was composed of stout log buildings with low roofs, some thatched, others shingled. Smoke billowed from the chimneys, giving the air a woody smell. The buildings had wide porches where people gathered to talk and conduct business. Occasionally, a window brightened as a candle or lamp was lit. Aragon heard men talking loudly in the evening air while wives scurried to fetch their husbands, scolding them for being late. Aragon wove his way between the houses to the butcher's shop, a broad, thick-beamed building. Overhead, the chimney belched black smoke. He pushed the door open. The spacious room was warm and well-lit by a fire snapping in a stone fireplace. A bare counter stretched across the far side of the room. The floor was strewn with loose straw. Everything was scrupulously clean, 
as if the owner spent his leisure time digging in obscure crannies from minuscule pieces of filth. Behind the counter stood the butcher, Sloan. A small man, he wore a cotton shirt and a long, blood-stained smock. An impressive array of knives swung from his belt. He had a sallow, pockmarked face, and his black eyes were suspicious. He polished the counter with a ragged cloth. Sloane's mouth twisted as Aragon entered. Well, the mighty hunter joins the rest of us mortals. How many did you beg this time? None, was Aragon's curt reply. He had never liked Sloane. The butcher always treated him with disdain, as if he were something unclean. A widower, Sloane seemed to care for only one person, his daughter, Katrina, on whom he doted. I'm amazed, said Sloane with affected astonishment. He turned his back on Aragon to scrape something off the wall. And that's your reason for coming here? Yes, admitted Aragon uncomfortably. If that's the case, let's see your money. Sloane tapped his fingers when Aragon shifted his feet and remained silent. Come on. Either you have it or you don't. Which is it? I don't really have any money, but I do. What? No money? The butcher cut him off sharply. Can you expect to buy meat? Are the other merchants giving away their wares? Should I just hand you the goods without charge? Besides, he said abruptly, it's late. Come back tomorrow with money. I'm closed for the day. Aragon glared at him. I can't wait until tomorrow, Sloane. It'll be worth your while, though. He pulled out the stone with a flourish and set it gently on the scarred counter, where it gleamed with light from the dancing flames. Stole it is more likely, muttered Sloane, leaning forward with an interested expression. Ignoring the comment, Aragon said, Will this be enough? Sloane picked up the stone and gauged its weight speculatively. He ran his hand over its smoothness and inspected the white veins. With a calculating look, he set it down. It's pretty, but how much is it worth? I don't know, admitted Aragon. But no one would have gone to the trouble of shaping it unless it had some value. Obviously, said Sloane with exaggerated patience. But how much value? Since you don't know, I suggest that you find a trader who does, or take my offer of three crowns. That's a miser's bargain. It must be worth at least ten times that, protested Aragon. Three crowns would not buy enough meat to last a week. Sloane shrugged. If you don't like my offer, wait until the traders arrive. Either way, I'm tired of this conversation. The traders were a nomadic group of merchants and entertainers who visited Carval every spring and winter. They bought whatever excess the villagers and local farmers had managed to grow or make, and sold what they needed to live through another year. Seeds, animals, fabric, and supplies like salt and sugar. But Aragon did not want to wait until they arrived. It could be a while, and his family needed the meat now. Fine, I accept, he snapped. Good. I'll get you the meat. Not that it matters, but where did you find this? Two nights ago, in the spine. Get out! Demanded Sloane, pushing the stone away. He stomped furiously to the end of the counter and started scrubbing old bloodstains off a knife. Why? Asked Aragon. He drew the stone closer, as if to protect it from Sloane's wrath. I won't deal with anything you bring back from those damned mountains. Take your sorcerer's stone elsewhere. Sloane's hand suddenly slipped, and he cut a finger on the knife, but he seemed not to notice. He continued to scrub, staining the blade with fresh blood. You refuse to sell to me? Yes, unless you pay with coins. Sloane growled and hefted the knife, sidling away. Go, before I make you. The door behind them slammed open. Aragon whirled around, ready for more trouble. In stomped Horst, a hulking man. Sloane's daughter, Katrina, a tall girl of sixteen, trailed behind him with a determined expression. Aragon was surprised to see her. She usually absented herself from any arguments involving her father. Sloane glanced at them warily, then started to accuse Aragon. He won't... quiet, announced Horst in a rumbling voice, cracking his knuckles at the same time. He was Carvajal's smith, 
as his thick neck and scarred leather apron attested. His powerful arms were bare to the elbow. A great expanse of hairy, muscular chest was visible through the top of his shirt. A black beard, carelessly trimmed, roiled and knotted like his jaw muscles. Sloane, what have you done now? Nothing. He gave Aragon a murderous gaze, then spat. This boy came in here and started badgering me. I asked him to leave, but he won't budge. I even threatened him, and he still ignored me. Sloane seemed to shrink as he looked at Horst. Is this true? demanded the smith. No, replied Aragon. I offered this stone as payment for some meat, and he accepted it. When I told him that I'd found it in the spine, he refused to even touch it. What difference does it make where it came from? Horst looked at the stone curiously, then returned his attention to the butcher. Why won't you trade with him, Sloane? I've no love for the spine myself. But if it's a question of the stone's worth, I'll back it with my own money. The question hung in the air for a moment. Then Sloane licked his lips and said, This is my own store. I can do whatever I want. Katrina stepped out from behind Horst and tossed back her auburn hair like a spray of molten copper. Father, Aragon is willing to pay. Give him the meat, and then we can have supper. Sloane's eyes narrowed dangerously. Go back to the house. This is none of your business. I said go. Katrina's face hardened, and then she marched out of the room with a stiff back. Aragon watched with disapproval, but dared not interfere. Horst tugged at his beard before saying reproachfully, Fine. You can deal with me. What were you going to get, Aragon? His voice reverberated through the room. As much as I could. Horst pulled out a purse and counted out a pile of coins. Give me your best roasts and steaks. Make sure that it's enough to fill Aragon's pack. The butcher hesitated his gaze darting between Horst and Aragon. Not selling to me would be a very bad idea, stated Horst. Glowering venomously, Sloane slipped into the back room. A frenzy of chopping, rapping, and low cursing reached them. After several uncomfortable minutes, he returned with an armful of wrapped meat. His face was expressionless as he accepted Horst's money, then proceeded to clean his knife, pretending that they were not there. Horst scooped up the meat and walked outside. Aragon hurried behind him, carrying his pack and the stone. The crisp night air rolled over their faces, refreshing after the stuffy shop. Thank you, Horst. Uncle Garrow will be pleased. Horst laughed quietly. Don't thank me. I've wanted to do that for a long time. Sloane's a vicious troublemaker. It does him good to be humbled. Katrina heard what was happening and ran to fetch me. Good thing I came. The two of you were almost at blows. Unfortunately, I doubt he'll serve you or any of your family the next time you go in there, even if you do have coins. Why did he explode like that? We've never been friendly, but he's always taken our money. And I've never seen him treat Katrina that way, said Aragon, opening the top of the pack. Horst shrugged. Ask your uncle. He knows more about it than I do. Aragon stuffed the meat into his pack. Well, now I have one more reason to hurry home, to solve this mystery. Here, this is rightfully yours. He proffered the stone. Horst chuckled. No, you keep your strange rock. As for payment, Albreach plans to leave for Finestar next spring. He wants to become a master smith. And I'm going to need an assistant. You can come and work off the debt on your spare days. Aragon bowed slightly, delighted. Horst had two sons, Albreach and Baldor, both of whom worked in his forge. Taking one's place was a generous offer. Again, thank you. I look forward to working with you. He was glad that there was a way for him to pay Horst. His uncle would never accept charity. Then Aragon remembered what his cousin had told him before he left on the hunt. Rorin wanted me to give Katrina a message, but since I can't, can you get it to her? Of course. 
He wants to tell her that he'll come into town as soon as the merchants arrive, and that he will see her then. That all? Aragon was slightly embarrassed. No, he also wants her to know that she is the most beautiful girl he has ever seen, and that he thinks of nothing else. Horst's face broke into a broad grin, and he winked at Aragon. Getting serious, isn't he? Yes, sir. Aragon answered with a quick smile. Could you also give her my thanks? It was nice of her to stand up to her father for me. I hope that she isn't punished because of it. Rorin would be furious if I got her into trouble. I wouldn't worry about it. Sloane doesn't know that she called me, so I doubt he'll be too hard on her. Before you go, will you sup with us? I'm sorry, but I can't. Garrow is expecting me, said Aragon, tying off the top of the pack. He hoisted it onto his back and started down the road, raising his hand in farewell. The meat slowed him down, but he was eager to be home, and renewed vigor filled his steps. The village ended abruptly, and he left its warm lights behind. The pearlescent moon peeked over the mountains, bathing the land in a ghostly reflection of daylight. Everything looked bleached and flat. Near the end of his journey, he turned off the road, which continued south. A simple path led straight through waist-high grass and up a knoll, almost hidden by the shadows of protective elm trees. He crested the hill and saw a gentle light shining from his home. The house had a shingled roof with a brick chimney. Eaves hung over the whitewashed walls, shadowing the ground below. One side of the enclosed porch was filled with split wood, ready for the fire. A jumble of farm tools cluttered the other side. The house had been abandoned for half a century when they moved in. It was ten miles from Carvajal, farther than anyone else's. People considered the distance dangerous because the family could not rely on help from the village in times of trouble, but Aragon's uncle would not listen. A hundred feet from the house, in a dull-colored barn, lived two horses, Berka and Bruch, with chickens and a cow. Sometimes there was also a pig, but they had been unable to afford one this year. A wagon sat wedged between the stalls. On the edge of their fields, a thick line of trees traced along the Anora River. He saw a light move behind a window as he warily reached the porch. Uncle, it's Aragon. Let me in. A small shutter slid back for a second, then the door swung inward. Garrow stood with his hand on the door. His worn clothes hung on him like rags on a stick frame. A lean, hungry face with intense eyes gazed out from under graying hair. He looked like a man who had been partly mummified before it was discovered that he was still alive. Roaring sleeping, was his answer to Aragon's inquiring glance. A lantern flickered on a wooden table so old that the grain stood up in tiny ridges like a giant fingerprint. Near a wood stove were rows of cooking utensils tacked onto the wall with homemade nails. A second door opened to the rest of the house. The floor was made of boards polished smooth by years of tramping feet. Aragon pulled off his pack and took out the meat. What's this? Did you buy meat? Where did you get the money? Asked his uncle harshly as he saw the wrapped packages. Aragon took a breath before answering, No... Horst bought it for us. You let him pay for it? I told you before, I won't beg for our food. If we can't feed ourselves, we might as well move into town. Before you can turn around twice, they'll be sending us used clothes and asking if we'll be able to get through the winter. Garrow's face paled with anger. I didn't accept charity, snapped Aragon. Horst agreed to let me work off the debt this spring. He needs someone to help him because Albreach is going away. And where will you get the time to work for him? Are you going to ignore all the things that need to be done here? Asked Garrow, forcing his voice down. Aragon hung his bow and quiver on hooks beside the front door. I don't know how I'll do it, he said irritably. Besides, I found something that could be worth some money. He set the stone on the table. Garrow bowed over it. The hungry look on his face became ravenous, and his fingers moved with a strange twitch. You found this in the spine? Yes, said Aragon. 
He explained what had happened. And to make matters worse, I lost my best arrow. I'll have to make more before long. They stared at the stone in the near darkness. How was the weather? Asked his uncle, lifting the stone. His hands tightened around it, like he was afraid it would suddenly disappear. Cold, was Aragorn's reply. It didn't snow, but it froze each night. Garrow looked worried by the news. Tomorrow, you'll have to help Rorin finish harvesting the barley. If we can get the squash picked, too, the frost won't bother us. He passed the stone to Aragorn. Here, keep it. When the traders come, we'll find out what it's worth. Selling it is probably the best thing to do. The less we're involved with magic, the better. Why did Horst pay for the meat? It took only a moment for Aragorn to explain his argument with Sloane. I just don't understand what angered him so. Garrow shrugged. Sloane's wife, Ismira, went over the Igualda Falls a year before you were brought here. He hasn't been near the spine since, nor had anything to do with it. But that's no reason to refuse payment. I think he wanted to give you trouble. Aragorn swayed blearily and said, It's good to be back. Garrow's eyes softened, and he nodded. Aragorn stumbled to his room, pushed the stone under his bed, then fell onto the mattress. Home. For the first time since before the hunt, he relaxed completely as sleep overtook him.